And so we're very uh, honored and delighted to have him here with us this evening. Sorry we're running a little late, Giovanni, but we appreciate you being here. And uh, let's give a warm of applause to uh, Giovanni. So this is it? And, um, yes. Okay, easy user interface. Okay. Um, everyone, I know I'm probably getting in the way of a drink or something. <laughs> uh, and you look a little bit tired, but we, we are going to shift gears here. Uh, you know, we heard six you know, pretty interesting pitches just a little while ago. Uh, I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about the art of the narrative. Uh, by narrative, I mean the story and the thing that you know, practically every startup needs. Um, I'm going to go through my story in a moment uh, because there is this tradition in the world of community organizing. That's where a lot of my work is today. We work with the White House. We work with the Democratic National Committee. Um, so our work spans nonprofits, government agencies, and startups. We believe that there's actually common learnings, things that could be learned from one another. There's a tradition in my world where if you're going to speak in front of a group and you're going to try to impart some advice, you better share your own story. <laughs> you know, why can I speak to entrepreneurs? And by the way, why can I speak to Latino entrepreneurs or what I've been calling Latinopreneurs? Um, I misspelled it, by the way. Not that it's in Merriam-Webster, but I got something wrong here <laughs> and I got a little bit of help. So yeah, the, the tradition is that you actually give testimony. You talk about your own story. So, what I want to do, though, beyond that, is talk about secrets. I want to talk about some secrets that I have, some secrets about us, you know, the people in this room included, uh, some secrets about our industry, this thing about art of the narrative. You know, why is it that some companies do this really well? And you know this. You've heard some really great pitches, especially you know, folks in the VC community. They listen to pitches all day long. Why do some people do it so much better? And why don't we share this with one another, right? So my own secrets. And this is important because it'll help you, you know, understand my path to Latinopreneurship. Um, the first thing you must know about me is that I'm actually terribly shy. There was a time when I could never get up in front of a room full of people because I don't know if you know Bob Myers-Briggs. Look it up, OK? People like this generally do not like to get up in front of a lot of people. They only, if they invite them to a party, they're going to be off in a corner just talking to one person maybe. That is actually how I met my wife. The second thing you must know about me, you're wondering probably, if you're looking at my t-shirt, what is 73? If you watch Big Bang Theory, you will know. But what I can tell you right now about myself here is that I actually have a fetish for prime numbers. <laughs> and. Um, there are a couple of reasons for it. One is, I was a math kid. When I was in high school, I taught myself five years of math in two years. I went off to college and studied religion, which is a big change. But um, numbers continue to dominate the way I think and organize the, uh, the world today. And you'll actually see it here. By the way, there are 53 slides. Yes, it's a prime number. The last thing is, where am I from? Well, that's a picture of Puerto Rico. Actually, the northernmost part of Puerto Rico, New York, right? <laughs> that's where I grew up. But what this tells you about me is, uh, well, Puerto Ricans, you know, uh, we think we're, in this, we're at the center of the world. And it actually happens to be true. If you look at a map, we are in the center of the world, right? But you go to New York City, and guess what? We had the same problem. We think we're the middle, you know, we're the center of the world. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember that. There was a very famous cover from the New Yorker magazine. What this tells you about me is that I'm beyond, you know, having the fetish, you know, for numbers and beyond being shy. I'm actually quite insular. Puerto Ricans are that way. Puerto Ricans actually have this issue, you know? Uh, we tend to see ourselves only or from the perspective of ourselves. And it actually is quite inhibiting. But it's, something else happens. So I go to Princeton, and they also have a problem. They don't even understand they're in New Jersey. They see themselves at the, <laughs> the middle of the academic world. But this is where I, I landed. I came to Silicon Valley after two careers. I was a writer, um, and then I became a theater producer. And at some point, I got married, and my wife subtly suggested I get a real job, and I became a marketing person in Silicon Valley. But again, I'm a shy person, I'm insular, I have to organize the world in small, odd prime numbers, right? You know what? This is perfect for marketing. Because a lot of people in this world have the ADD, you know, they have this need to organize things very simply. To reduce complexity to very, very simple phrases, 
uh, that are compelling, not just you know, to the team that you're working on, but potential investors and other people. Uh, so I built a business here, um, but before I built a business, I was a employee at an agency. I became a partner at a PR agency. And over the years, I started to get really interesting experiences with lots of different kinds of companies. Now, something happened along the way where it began with this, right? It was my goal. I became a consultant behind the scenes. Very good, by the way, for people who are shy. Um, but I started to look at the opportunity to grow this, you know, because a lot of the clients I'm advising, you know, they have technology to scale companies. And I started to see an opportunity. I said, you know what? I think, I think I might go here in this direction, you know, entrepreneurship. Because after you advise, you know, maybe some three dozen companies and, you know, ten of them actually do pretty well in getting funding and then maybe five of them have really spectacular exits, you start to wonder, you know, does it really make sense to be behind the company or can I start with myself? And actually, uh, today I'm speaking to you as a consultant. Uh, we are about to launch a technology platform in about six months, and if I ever come back to this event, it will probably be the pitch here. But something happened along the way. Life interrupted. It was back in 2008, I believe. Uh, we had just started our first consulting company. I was becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, when Charlene Lee, I think you probably know who she is, you know, very influential uh, you know, social media analyst, she got a call uh, from an organization called the National uh, Hispanic uh, Corporate Council. And this is a small group of very, very large companies. They have an annual event. They had it in San Francisco. This is US USF, not UCSF. Um, and they had to uh, put together uh, a keynote and a panel on social media. So they asked Charlene, can you recommend an Hispanic entrepreneur who knows a lot about social media? And she could only think of one person at first. Brian Solis was out of town. <laughs> and I got the call. And for the first time, I found myself speaking as a Hispanic. I had spoken as a business person at a lot of conferences, but suddenly I'm in this role of speaking as a Hispanic, and I knew a lot about social media. You know, I made it part of my practice, and I knew something about being Hispanic. I am Hispanic, right? But I never thought of the two things together. And it was a really interesting moment for me. Suddenly I start to think, you know, I thought I knew myself. I shared with you my weaknesses. There's something that's missing. I have not connected to my Hispanic identity. I got an invitation to an event that then changed my life. Um, it was a couple of years later, and San Juan had its first TEDx conference. And I don't know how many of you have been to TEDx conferences. Uh, they're all like this, by the way. It's the testimonial. You get in front of people, and you share your story. And through your story, people hopefully will see their own story and take action. It's a very, very interesting model. This is the first time this happened in Puerto Rico. And it was actually very interesting for two reasons. One is, I had not been there for 40 years. 4-0, by the way. 4-0. That shows you how distant, you know, been from my own Hispanic identity. But also, one thing I discovered, because I had been so distant, is that Puerto Rico was in serious, serious trouble. You know, crime, you, pro you probably know this, they're on the verge of default, which, by the way, you know, can send ripples you know, throughout you know, the entire global economy. You know, Puerto Rico could be the next Iceland, right? You know, if Puerto Rico fails, a lot of people might fail too. So it was there that I had this revelation. You know, all the people that have left Puerto Rico uh, probably still feel some kind of connection because if I can be emotional after having you know, been 40 years away from this island, there are probably a lot of other people you know, as well. So it dawned on me, this thing about entrepreneurship. You know, I'm entering this world now. I am speaking as a Latino entrepreneur when I speak in front of audiences, when I speak in front of people that are pitching their companies. It's not just about entrepreneurship. There's a special spin on it. And I like to call it Latinopreneurship. It's a special. It's different. By the way, I have one more secret. Please do not share this with anyone, but I don't speak Spanish. Fortunately, there is an app for that, right? <laughs> you can do that. But the reason why I'm sharing this slide with you is that this has really sensitized me to the whole issue of really being you know, tied to an identity. Because people have a lot of prejudgments about, you know, you 
say you're Hispanic, you say you're Puerto Rican. By the way, what would happen, I have to have this slide because people would come up to me afterwards and start speaking Spanish. And it was more embarrassing for them than for me because I would just smile and you know, I knew everything they were saying, but I couldn't reply, right? So I had to stop them. But it really sensitized me. So this is you know, an issue, you know, really take it carefully, you know, think about it carefully. I had a conversation with a journalist shortly after I started you know, speaking openly about you know, being you know, an Hispanic marketing person. And he said to me, you know what? You're actually helping to hurt the people that you represent, because what you're doing is ghettoizing Hispanics. And by the way, you're doing the same thing with African Americans. We work uh, for Morehouse College, one of the historic black universities in Atlanta. And he said, this whole multicultural approach, you know, it doesn't make sense. Really what we should be doing is pushing everyone into the mainstream. Well, you know what? It doesn't make sense. There is no mainstream. There never was. And the internet has shown us something, one, anything, is that we're not about mainstreams, we're about many streams. But there are three reasons why this matters. And I want to share this with you because you will be, I am sure, in conversations with people who will have the same reaction that the journalist did. By the way, he changed his mind. It was only after going through these arguments with me, right? The first one is, there are new markets, right? There are new markets, by the way, that are separated you know, from most people because of either uh, you know, access to language, right? Because they don't have the language skills, or customs, just knowledge, general knowledge. I wrote a, uh, well, by the way, I was gonna say, remember I showed you all those maps where I'm from, that you know, this is where I'm from, yeah, this is where we've been, but this is where we belong, by the way. This is Latin America, okay? In 2050, one in three Americans will be of Hispanic descent, okay? So another way of looking at this is this, this many stream, this focus on Hispanics is really important because this will be part of the mainstream, a much bigger part of the mainstream. So just this alone you know, is reason enough you know, to take Latino entrepreneurship very, very seriously, especially if you're looking about getting past those you know, barriers, you know, language and culture. New services, so when you have a better understanding of the people themselves, you can start to think about what kind of products actually make sense, right? I shared with you that we're, you know, my company will be launching a tech platform sometime this spring, um, and the tech platform should not be a surprise based on my reaction to, you know, to Puerto Rico, what happened there is gonna be about supporting diasporas. Well, this is something we're starting to see with a number of companies, including one uh, that presented earlier today, Interesante. They're not just a Hispanic pin Pinterest. What they're doing is looking at all these exile communities, people that have left Argentina, miss shopping in Argentina, love Argentina. Guess what, you really have to know Argentina if you're gonna build a business like that. Only a Latino preneur or uh, could, could have thought, of that, you know, thought about it that way. But this is the most important one. And if you find yourself in a dinner conversation defending you know, being a Latino preneur, please remember this. The opportunity here is to change the narrative, the common narrative that Americans have you know, for Hispanics. By the way, we went through a recent exercise with Morehouse College on this. The narrative for a lot of African American men it's cradle to prison. You're born predestined to wind up in the prison system. Really, really harmful to society. The costs are staggering. What if it could be this? What if you actually invested in not only uh, black education, but entrepreneurship? The new me looks at this, by the way. Uh, and I believe they're here this, uh, these two days. I, I, I don't know if Angela's here uh, you know, tonight, but um, that's an interesting narrative. It's very similar to the Hispanic narrative. Recently, I think this is the way most people you know, have been seeing it, right? In fact, this narrative dominates the debate around immigration, right? Because if all Hispanics are doing is looking for jobs, so aren't they gonna take it away from real Americans, right? It's a terrible narrative. And again, it's all about cost, it's not about opportunity. But what if it were this? What if it were a community that creates jobs? And by the way, a community that creates jobs not just for Hispanics, but for other people. That's where the narrative can really change. That is the opportunity for Latinopreneurship. And it should be part of everyone's narrative. 
Now, one thing I like to talk about with my clients is that a really powerful way to uh, position yourself in the economy is to look at the mega trends, look at the meta story, right? There's a huge meta story going on right now around entrepreneurship, right? Accelerators. Then there's crowdfunding. There are organizations like Jesse's. Why is America so crazy about accelerators? Well, I think it's because we've developed a, a narrative for America that we have to start creating opportunity again and jobs. And there's no faster way to do it than to start growing the base of people who actually create those jobs, right? So that is the meta, that is meta narrative, but the opportunity to do it in a very, very large market that is complex and only Latinos can probably lead, of course with the assistance of others, but the general benefit of society, that is, that is the challenge and that is the opportunity. So, narrative is important for three reasons. One, it's messaging in motion. You've probably done this, launching your own companies. What is my message, right? It's a story over time. It's like where you start and where you go. I shared my own story with you. Right, how somebody with my deficits actually found the right place, you know, some time. That's what all companies do. It's a story that goes forward. Second, it's not just about words. It's a blueprint for action. I'm sure the VCs or any investors here today are wondering about this. You know, how much of your early, you know, slides, especially if you're not even in beta, are going to translate into real action where you actually build upon the story, you know, that, that you share. And finally, it creates value for all constituents. I want to share seven things that really good companies do with messaging, and I hope that you know, it can help you with your own work. But first, I want to pause for a moment because I just shared with you this big, big story about what the Latino narrative can be, but it's not easy. And by the way, it's always important when you're doing strategy to make sure you understand how big the obstacle is, especially if you have an audacious vision, right? This was another TEDx talk. Uh, but this was uh, uh, the former President Salinas' son uh, who spoke at a TEDx, uh, I believe it was Mexico City, I'm not sure exactly where it was. And he spoke about the biggest problem facing Latin Americans. He said it's not violence, it's not the economy. The biggest problem that we face is that we're victims. The problem with the old narrative is that we have accepted it. It's not just what the so-called mainstream thinks. We are conditioned to not think like entrepreneurs. We're conditioned to think like the former, like the employee. I was an employee. I'm a Latino entrepreneur now, right? It's very easy. There are many reasons for this. My favorite is that I believe that we house both the oppressed and the oppressor inside us. And when people say they're Latino, they half the time they don't know what they're saying. What does that mean? The indigenous side, right? Or is it Cortez, you know? It's very, very confusing to people, but we got it. We got it. Just face that. This is the biggest secret that we had. I said we were sharing secrets. But let's talk about the positive side, right? What if we could share all the secrets of the trade with one another? What the really, really good companies do. I'll try to go through this very quickly because I think I'm using up all my time here. So, first, I felt this in the room a couple of times this afternoon when people got up here. And they actually had visions for something that they really, really cared about. If you do not care about the company that you want to start, all you're doing is hiring yourself for a job. A job that you're not going to like, a job that you're going to leave, right? And by the way, investors will know that. They will feel it. If it feels too much like something else that they've heard, it's because it's not original. It's because it's not passionate. Somebody's talked about passion before, right? You're absolutely right. We get confused about passion. We think it's something really fluffy. No, it's belief. It's deep belief that this is who you are and what you want to do. Please understand that. Choose a big, big problem. Investors like to look at pitches and think, what is the value here? Because actually, you know, and this is a secret in the Valley, valuation is not about anything to do with money. It's actually what's perceived as value because the customer may not be who you think it is. The customer may be the company that buys you. So this is why you, know, you see social media companies selling at crazy valuations because it means something to the company that needs to have what they have. But choose a big problem, go big. By the way, I was gonna say go big and go home. I just took apart that phrase on Facebook the other day. Sometimes going big is staying home, okay? 
and being true to who you are, which is a very, very big problem. One of the first companies I got to work with, uh, I was employee 150, was VMware. Uh, this was back uh, just before the first bust. They actually powered through that bust, you know, the dot-com uh, you know, bust, because they actually chose to look at something very, very good for you know, the, uh, the, the recession economy that was heading on. They, did, they had a really big vision to virtualize, and this sounds very geeky, to virtualize the Intel chip for servers. There were a lot of those uh, servers all around. Uh, they were cheap. And they were just at the beginning stages of transforming the data center industry, right? Uh, very, very big vision. And they had a big solution, by the way, right? It's a really good example. It taught me very early, look, make sure you're choosing very, very big problems. Uh, if you're passionate about it, some, uh, something, probably is, right? Know and name the enemy, OK? This might sound a little warrior-like, right? But please, understand that this is true, OK? Um, you might have heard about this book if you're my age. <laughs> if you're younger, you probably did it. Uh, Saul Linsky uh, wrote probably the, the greatest classic on community organizing. And he talks about how it's really important to name the enemy. Now look, the enemy not, may not be a person. The enemy may not be an organization. It may not be, oh, your competitor. Like, oh, I'm going to take on Cisco. No, your enemy might be a business model that's just got to get blown up because uh, the companies that do lead the market haven't really thought about it. Really, really good companies understand this and work on it. By the way, this is the current you know, a book to read on this topic. Uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about how very little companies and, uh, and, and people who are uh, not as prepared you know, can actually subvert the dynamic by thinking about the, you know, the assets and you know, how things can change. And it's through that, uh, you know, that, that battle you know, between the little and the large that value is created. Understand this. It's really important uh, for somebody to understand you know, how powerful is your company, your potential company. Deliver a product that subverts the enemy matter. Okay, so we just said, look, okay, you've got a big vision, you have a big enemy, it could be complacency, you could actually be a company, right? Uh, make sure that the product delivers on that, okay? Now, VMware did that. I want to go back to them for a moment because it was really great science. It came out of Stanford, uh, by the way. Uh, just, before, just around the time that Google was having a story understood, uh, Silicon Valley investors began to understand, you know, all this stuff that's happening inside universities is really interesting because the hard science is the hard part. Now, if you can actually marry the science you know, to something that's you know, you know, really important in the marketplace, you've got something. Do not dismiss technology. Get serious about it, okay? Especially if you have an audacious vision, you know. Do not... Uh, go for uh, the easy path on technology. VMware trounced this competition, uh, which was Microsoft at the time. Uh, I forget the name of the company that had a virtualization product because it was very, very weak, right? So um, subverting the story. I want to talk to you about a couple of other valuation stories. So Instagram, of course, you know, Facebook bought them. Why did they get such a great valuation? Well, Facebook had this identity issue. We're about photographs. Right? We, are, we are photos, right? We can't have somebody else in the market like this. Well, they're facing another, uh, another struggle, this company, Snapchat. They're not getting them, right? Because the story, again, is subversive. They can't have a mobile messaging uh, a platform uh, that could potentially be the next social network on mobile. So this is a, a big problem. Now, how deliberate was you know, this positioning? I don't think it was positioning here. Again, it's a roadmap for action. You know, and they're doing quite well. It's spectacular, and people still can't understand why is the valuation there? Because somebody cares about it. Because the company you know, really cares about it. Know your real customers. Okay, I mentioned this earlier, right? You know, when we say customer, you have to be very careful. You know, of course, there's always a consumer. If you're any company, you have to think about the end you know, user. Uh, but sometimes, as I said, it's the company that will buy you. So company I got to work with, Ribbit, uh, maybe three, four years ago, understood that they had a value proposition that would appeal to one customer. It's the carrier that didn't have what they have, which was a way to quickly build applications um, on the web and on mobile. So they positioned themselves as Silicon Valley's first phone company, a crazy statement and audacious. Uh, but if you peeled back the layers of what they had, it actually was a very attractive uh, set of technologies for phone companies. They were bought by British Telecom seven months after they launched with zero revenue. 
uh, for $105 million. It's not bad for seven months, right? But there is a company, you know, example of just really understanding who the customer was. Um, this is what happened. Empower them. We only have two more. So you know the customer, and by the way, it's probably multiple constituents, right? What do you do? Uh, we heard from Cradismo, you know, earlier. Um, the reason why empowerment is so important is that just as we're seeing this upward trajectory, you know, for how we think about people, empowering them to become entrepreneurs, we're seeing throughout the entire landscape of interactions between government, businesses, and nonprofits to empower the people that they serve. It's one reason why crowdfunding is, uh, is taking off really big, but it's also uh, the reason why you're starting to see so much functionality on social sites, you know, where the user has so much control. Think about this very, very carefully. Um, in the end, it's really about trends that happen over time, and empowerment is, is the end story you know, for a lot, of, uh, a lot of technologies. I heard an interesting pitch at Manos Accelerator, uh, a company called Hemheis, uh, that solving a really interesting problem for women. What if you don't have, and please, I hope I'm not embarrassing anyone, right? But what if you're, you don't have the mainstream body? <laughs> What if you know, you're really more in the many streams and it's really difficult to find stuff online? They have a really wonderful idea for user experience that can actually help a woman find what she wants, fashionable and affordable. Really good example about empowering uh, you know, the, the, uh, the customer. And finally, and this goes back to the Latino Pernum uh, narrative. Mix inside and outside the tribe. Again, I had that conversation with a journalist. I'm not gonna out him, by the way, because uh, he probably doesn't want to be embarrassed that way, but I can you know, tell you he's thinking differently now. Uh, but he did make me think about something. If all we did was hang out with each other, we'd be missing a really big opportunity. Again, Latino entrepreneurship, Latinopreneurship creates benefit for everyone. The future of America, we're part of the future, we're not the only. Uh, there are other cultures and there is this idea of general culture, right? I want to give you an example of a company that actually proved itself in the so-called mainstream world. Another Manos Accelerator company, uh, this is uh, HubSpot. Uh, at the same time that, uh, I think it was around the time that they first came out uh, to Manos, right? Uh, they took advantage of their time here to compete uh, at the Angel Hack Global. They won. And of course, the headlines were, Mexican company. Mexican company wins, right? This is beautifully subversive, right? And I thought it showed an incredible amount of huspa, you know, and um, spunk, you know, you know, to, to do that and win this kind of story. It, uh, it shows that this is not a ghetto. In fact, this might be, this neighborhood that we have, you know, Latino entrepreneurship might actually be a really high-end neighborhood. So it's really important not just for yourselves as founders, you know, to mix with the, uh, with, with the rest of the world. It's important for the general category and for the community. I wish you well. Mil gracias.